Welcome to the Video Workbench Classic Series Instructional Video, How to Build and Paint Figures. Medieval warrior King Macbeth comes to life under the skillful hand of internationally acclaimed figure modeler Kevin Golden. You'll learn how to create amazingly realistic groundwork, paint stunning, lifelike eyes, and skin tones. Learn to paint metal, plastic, and resin figures, and work with enamel, acrylics, and oils. Perfect for making great looking figures and groundwork to enhance any model kit or diorama. Even though originally produced in 1992, the techniques used in this video still cover everything you need to get going with your model kit. The examples shown here really haven't changed too much. There is no definitive way of building a model kit. Everyone has their own way of doing things, and with time, so will you. This video teaches dozens of useful tips, no matter what your skill level, including what I consider the three important T's of model kit building, tips, tools, and techniques. I would like to talk a little bit about the instructor in this video, Kevin Golden. Kevin Golden has been a multiple award-winning figure painter and diorama builder for more than a decade. He has also written the Go Figure column in the Journal of the International Plastic Modeler Society. I hope by watching this video that you walk away with a better knowledge of how to safely and correctly assemble a plastic model kit, along with having found or coming back into a hobby that is very fun and rewarding. Thank you and enjoy. Painting military miniatures is a combination of both art and modeling, with a strong emphasis on art. Fascinating figures from history are brought to life with the stroke of an artist's brush to capture the eye and imagination of those who view this three-dimensional art. Those of us who build and paint military figures recognize the victories and bitter defeats of military men and women throughout history. Welcome to Video Workbench and How to Paint Military Miniatures. I'm your host, Kevin Golden, feature writer for the International Plastic Modeler Society on Figure Painting. For the next hour, I'll show you the methods and techniques I use to bring military figures to life. Please realize the techniques I'm about to show you will work with any modeling medium, whether you work in metal, resin, or plastic. And these techniques can be applied to any skill level, whether you're just starting out or whether you have a number of figures under your belt. All the lessons learned can be applied to your figure painting. I'm also going to show you how to mix, sculpt, detail, and paint groundwork, and how to mount your figure to your base. This way, you can accentuate your masterpiece and enter modeling shows and competitions. I'll also let you in on some secrets for modeling contests and tell you what judges look for. As with all modeling projects, preparation is the key. Step one, collect all information available on your subject and study it carefully. The kit instructions are a good place to start, but there are many other resources, such as history books and libraries, magazines devoted to military history, and feature films on videotape about historical figures. Since many historical figures existed long before photography, you'll have to check color references with reproductions of paintings. Although strict regimental uniforms and colors did not exist in the 11th century, I won't vary from earth tones because that's the clothing dyes that were common 900 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
The tools you'll need will be a Dremel Moto tool or pin vise, number 43 and 49 drill bit, a buffing pad and chuck for the Dremel, 3 16 inch brass rod, fine steel wool and scotch bright, safety glasses, optivisors with a number 10 lens, exacto number one handle, and a number 11 blade, needle file assortment, a couple of toothpicks, a spoon, old toothbrush, a small mixing bowl, a small block of wood, an assortment of good round flat and bright brushes, preferably Windsor Newton Series 7, number triple aught through number two, a palette knife, palette or wax paper, and a cleaning rag. Preparation is the same, whether your figure is metal, resin, or plastic. With your needle files, your number one exacto knife handle, your number 11 blade, steel wool and scotch bright, file down the molding seams. For resin figures, cut off the molding blocks and sand them smooth. Also, sand off or file down molding flash or anything else sticking out that doesn't belong. Also, file down the lugs on the bottoms of his feet because that's where the brass rods will go. Fill in any small pits with cyanoacrylate glue, commonly called super glue. A shot of zip kicker will speed the drying. A little bit of 240 grit sandpaper will smooth out that area. To fill larger areas, I recommend A and B epoxy putty. Other modeling putties work well, but A and B is a very fine grain putty, finer than most brands. You smooth A and B with water and an old brush, and the curing stage gives you plenty of working times, roughly a few hours. You can cure the A and B putty faster by placing your figure in the oven at low heat or under a light bulb. Incidentally, don't put plastic in the oven. When you finish this stage of the cleanup, lightly sand the parts with fine 600 grit sandpaper or fine scotch bright. If you're working on a metal figure, use fine steel wool. Sand lightly so you won't damage any detail. Your sanding will accomplish two things. First, it gets rid of any mold release residue remaining on the parts so you don't have to wash any parts. Second, sanding gives the surface tooth to hold the primer, which we'll apply later. While checking your references, correct any inaccuracies in your figure. This could be improper badges or insignia pertaining to the regiment that your figure is supposed to belong to. Sometimes the kit isn't historically accurate and you've got to make changes. Again, consult your references carefully. Re-etch detail, such as hair, using your X-Acto knife and a number 11 blade. This will give your figure's hair a nice, crisp definition for painting. Now we're ready to begin assembly. First, dry fit all your parts to see where any corrections need to be made. Dry fitting also helps you see where you can make assembly easier. If your figure is going to be carrying any heavier equipment, or if the limbs are under any undue stress, I suggest pinning the limbs. For larger figures, 70 millimeter and up, I use 1 16th inch brass rod. For smaller scales, such as 54 millimeter or 1 32nd or 1 35th scale, I use 1 32nd inch brass rod. Brass rod is soft enough to bend, if you want, and strong enough to give the figure ample support. You can buy a small scale brass rod at any hobby shop. To install brass rod pins into your figure, you'll need a motor tool with a drill bit slightly larger than your brass rod size. For 1 16th inch brass rod, I use a number 43 drill bit. You want a larger size drill bit so the rod can be easily inserted into your figure. Be sure to wear your safety glasses when working with the motor tool or any other power tools. When working with a motor tool on small figures or thin areas on your figure, I highly recommend a pin vise. Most motor tools, such as the Dremel 5 speed model, spin too fast even at the slowest speed and you can end up breaking a delicate part. It will take longer to drill by hand, but your figure will stay in one piece. I recommend that you always pin the supporting part of the figure, such as the figure's feet, if he's standing or running. Pinning gives the figure support when it's on its display base and pins also give you a way to attach the figure to the painting block. 
If you intend to travel with your figure to shows like I do, the vibration of travel and the possibility of your figure getting knocked over means pitting your figure is a must. Also, if you ever do any commission work, your client won't want to see his piece fall over after paying big bucks for it. You pin the figure's legs the same way you pin the arms if you had to. As before, be very careful of torque when drilling holes in the feet. Drill as straight as possible or you'll be in for some extra gap filling. Try to drill up through the heel, not through the instep or toes. If you drill up through the instep, your rod can be seen between the foot and the ground. If you drill through the front half of the foot, you will drill all the way through. Drill your pinholes up into the figure leg approximately half the distance between the knee and ankle. Apply super glue to the end of the rod that will go into the foot. Insert the rod into the foot. Cut the mounting rod long enough to protrude out of the bottom of the heel half inch to an inch. Once you've assembled the kit and posed it the way you want, fill in small areas with super glue or five minute epoxy and fill in larger areas with A and B epoxy putty. Then sand the seams. Depending on how smooth you filled your gaps will determine what grit sandpaper to use. If your filled in gaps are rough, start with 280 grit sandpaper or an emery board or file. Work your way down to 400 grit and finally 600 grit. If you filled gaps with A and B putty and smooth the seams with a wet brush, you'll probably only need light sanding with 600 grit sandpaper. Now we need to temporarily mount the figure to the painting block. The fit of these rods in the block is extremely important. You're not going to glue the figure to this painting block, but the fit has to be tight enough so the figure won't fall out when you hold it at different angles. So use the 1 16th inch bit and slowly work it around the edges of the hole just to widen it a bit. Now you can hold the figure securely and easily remove it later. With the figure mounted on the painting block, you're ready for priming. But there's something else you'll have to tackle first. The final base you'll mount your figure. Choosing your base for final mounting is very important. The base is a reflection of your work and it reminds the viewer that all your effort hasn't just gone into your figure. When choosing your base, there are four things to consider. One, the height of the base. Two, the amount of surface area. Three, what shape of base, whether round, cubed, or domed. Four, and the type of wood. There are some general rules when choosing bases. One, the height of the base shouldn't overpower the figure. It should support the scene without looking top heavy. A base that's two or three inches is a good height for miniatures ranging from 70 to 120 millimeter. A base one to two inches high will work for small figures, such as 54 to 65 millimeter and 132nd and 135th scale figures. Two, the top of the base should be roughly the same as its height if your figure is a standard posed figure. For example, a cube base three inches high should have a top three inches across. A round base three inches high should be three inches across the top. A running figure would need more room. And if you want extra material, such as trees, fences, or even another figure on the base, you'll need more area. Just be careful not to overpower the main subject. If you don't have a curio cabinet or a showcase, you may want to consider a domed base to keep the dust off. If you plan on adding a nameplate, make sure there's enough frontal area on the base. On a domed base, space is limited. Also, a curved base is a little trickier to mount a nameplate as compared to a cube. After you've decided on your final base, mark the base with the brass rods protruding from the figure's feet as you did with the painting block. The walnut base that I'm using to mount my Macbeth is slanted to depict a hillside defensive position for the battle just north of the village of Lumfannon. You can build up a flat base to a slant with a piece of styrofoam or wood, then cover it with groundwork. I'll glue a piece of wood where his left foot will be, drill it out so the rod can be inserted. This way, I can depict his foot braced against a small mound of earth. Drill out the indentations with the next size drill bit up from 1 16th. When you're finally finished with your figure, you'll want to be able to easily insert it into the base. You don't want to have to fight to mount your work since you might ruin your paint job. With this base, it's easy to remember where the front is, but on a perfectly flat cube or round base, you might forget. Here's a tip. Mark the bottom with an arrow pointing to the front. This way, as I build my groundwork, I won't obscure the front area around the figure. As a general rule, taller bushes, fences, etc. go to the back behind the figure. 
Groundwork is very important for setting the mood of the piece. It tells the viewer the type of terrain and the conditions the soldier fought in. You can build groundwork out of a lot of different materials. I use celluclay paper mache, although there are other brands like Sculptamold and Sculpey. Remember, don't overpower your figure, don't overcrowd your base, and don't have too much open space. Balance is very important. Account for the space you have with what you will put on it, including the figure. Gutter dirt that you find under rain gutters makes excellent small pebbles and stones because of its fine texture. Scale is of the utmost importance. Regular dirt and stones on your base will make your figure look like he's standing on the rocky terrain of Mars or on the top of a coal heap. Dried roots make excellent trees. The small fiber-like roots represent branches in a small scale better than a twig snapped off a tree. Equipment from a recent battle can be strewn around. Broken down fences can be made from balsa. To make short grass, use an aftermarket product called static grass that you can sprinkle on your base or use hemp rope for tall grass. If you want to simulate snow, I recommend baking soda, glass beads, or a mixture of glass beads and baking soda. Baking soda simulates a powdered snow while glass beads looks like snow crystals. You apply it to your groundwork with a diluted white glue. To make small puddles, use five minute epoxy. Many figure kits come with accessories such as brick walls, parts of torn down buildings, signs, etc. Use this kit detail or make your own. I don't use groundwork provided in the kits unless it's unique because the groundwork you scratch build is much more convincing. The materials for groundwork are almost endless. Just remember to keep everything to scale. One hint, stay away from lichen. It looks very unrealistic and will make your base look amateurish. For my best groundwork, I'll use kitty litter, which also makes great small pebbles and stones and can be crushed into a vast assortment of sizes. Let's mix our groundwork together. With a small bowl, add a little water, a generous amount of white glue, and a couple of drops of dish detergent. This gives the mixture a cohesion that will prevent cracking when the mixture dries. Last, mix in water-based paint to represent your ground color. I use polyester water-based paint since it dries very matte. Stir this mixture thoroughly. Mix and knead it with an old metal spoon. A plastic spoon might break. Paper mache is very absorbent and will soak up the liquid quickly. Add enough celluclay to make a mixture that is very dry but malleable, like dry oatmeal. If it's too moist, it will take forever to dry. You can shorten drying time by putting the mixture under low heat like a light bulb. With a low tack tape, like drafting tape, tape off the top edge of the base so you won't get any of your mixture on your base. Use a hobby knife to make an etching on the top of the base where the groundwork will be applied. Use a number one handle with a number 11 blade. This etching will provide tooth for the groundwork. Thin white glue with water. Use an old paintbrush to spread this over the top of the base. Use toothpicks to plug the base holes you drilled out earlier. Then, with a palette knife, which you can buy from any art store, spread the mixture over the base, just like spreading peanut butter on bread. With your palette knife, sculpt in the relief of your groundwork. Make crags and ridges with the edge of your knife, or smooth certain areas by dipping the palette knife in a little water. Rises and contours will enhance the groundwork when you dry brush later. When you're satisfied with the contours of your groundwork, sprinkle on your rocks, stones, and add your tall grass or roots and press into your groundwork. Add a thin layer of diluted white glue over the stones and around the base of your bushes, tall grass, and trees to help secure them.
Set your groundwork aside to dry or put it under low heat to speed up drying. We'll add static grass later. When your groundwork is dried, you're ready to add a wash to help pick out the relief you added earlier. Start with a dark earth color oil paint, in this case burn umber. Apply a little to your palette with your palette knife and add a little Dorland's wax. Oil finish is dry glossy and the Dorland's wax helps to dull the finish. I use mineral spirits or regular thinner instead of turpentine because I don't like the strong odor of turpentine. Brush the thinner liberally over the relief and notice how it flows into all the ridges and crags you added earlier, giving them shading and definition. When finished, set aside to dry. When your wash is dry, you're ready to dry brush. On your palette, mix successively lighter shades of your groundwork color with oil colors such as raw sienna, Mars orange, Mars yellow, Naples yellow, and a touch of white to pop out the raised relief. When mixing paint, start with the darker of these colors. Remember to mix in a little Dorland's wax to matte things. With a wide, flat brush, dip into the paint, then brush off as much paint as possible. Lightly brush across the raised detail of your groundwork and the traces of paint will catch on the raised relief. This will make detail jump out, setting it apart from the shadowed washes in the ridges providing an illusion of depth. Repeat this procedure with each of the five colors from darker to lighter. Remember you're dry brushing. If you use the thinner to clean the brush off in between each successive color, the brush will no longer be dry, it'll be damp. The last time, use just minute traces of white on the highest relief areas. When everything on your base is dry, you can then apply static grass. Dilute white glue, then spread it over the areas for the grass. Then apply the static grass with tweezers. Finally, blow off any excess grass or snow. After your grass or snow is dry, test fit your figure in your groundwork again, making sure none of the features in your groundwork interferes. Any gaps under his feet can be filled with static grass. Dry brush the static grass using greens, browns, and yellows to give you a realistic grassy appearance. Tall grass made from hemp rope can be left its original tan color to simulate dried grass, or you can paint it in a grass green mixture of oil paint with a little Dorland's wax added. When dry, you can lightly dry brush the tops with yellow and tan. Let's go back to our figure. We're now ready for priming. For resin and plastic figures, I just lightly spray on a few coats of Floquel Gray Primer. This gives the top coat something to hold on to. The gray primer also makes a good canvas to paint on, and any surface flaws that still need to be corrected will stick out like a sore thumb. With metal figures, I hand paint on Emery Risley Figure Primer before I hit it with the Floquel Spray. The reason for different primer on metal is because with metal you need complete coverage. Paint has a hard time sticking to metal as compared to resin or plastic. Plus, 
you want to protect your figure against possible metal fatigue. By hand painting with Emery Risley, I can get complete coverage around areas that are hard to reach with the focal spray, such as around packs and equipment or up under arms and legs. The Emery Risley goes on smoother than Floquel, and you can keep your brush strokes to a minimum. However, the Emery Risley is an olive green color, which isn't a good base color, and IR doesn't have the tooth of the Floquel primer. To get around this, after covering the metal figure in IR, I can now lightly cover it with the Floquel primer. With the IR coat, I won't worry about the primer building up and running on the metal for me trying to hit every nook and cranny, which can happen with spray cans. The figure will have a nice light gray canvas to paint on and also good tooth to hold the top coat of paint. However, with Macbeth, the priming sequence will be totally different since he's wearing armor. Nothing simulates metal better than metal, so I won't prime the metal portions of his armor. Using a Dremel Moto tool on a buffing pad, I'll buff the metal portions of Mac's armor. Then, with fine steel wool, I'll buff his chain mail, his sword blade, scabbard hilt, the hub and outer frame of his shield, but not his helmet. His helmet will have a different luster than the other metallic parts. The steel wool gives the metal a different shine than the Dremel buffing pad. When you're finished buffing, come back with a soft Q-tip cotton swab and polish up your metallic portions to an even higher luster. Be sure to add the future only to the natural metal parts of his armor. Since the metallic portions won't be primed, there are two solutions to priming the rest of Macbeth. One, tape off the metal portions before brushing on the Emery Risley primer and spray with Floquel. Or, two, just brush on Floquel out of the bottle, which is what I'll do. Brush the Floquel on out of the bottle takes special care. Floquel dries so fast it can lump up before you can smooth out your brush strokes. To prevent this, Keep your primer thinned and apply small areas at a time. Be meticulous but patient. That's the biggest key to successful miniature painting, along with practice. When you're finished priming, set aside to dry. If you get a spot of primer on bare metal where you don't want it, wait till it dries and rub the spot off with the edge of a toothpick. There weren't any strict uniform regulations in the 11th century. The instructions say I can paint Macbeth's cloak in red, dark blue, green, or black. I had seen another interpretation in a magazine of a Macbeth painted in browns and tans in a tartan pattern. I decided I want mine painted in a tartan pattern also, but in reds and greens. Macbeth's quilted war coat will be painted buff, and his leggings dark blue. The leggings could also be dark green, brown, or black. The instructions say the shoes can be dark brown or tan. I opted for dark brown. According to the instructions, the baldric can be dark brown or tan. Again, I opted for dark brown. The buckle will be gold inset with different colors representing precious stones. The scabbard will be dark brown with the ties a different shade and the hilt is polished metal. In a magazine article featuring reproductions of medieval swords, I noticed a large variety of handles. I decided on a black grip and gold enamel guard. The blade is polished metal. The face of the shield can be painted to your preference, so I'll paint mine in two-fourths green and two-fourths brown with brass grips and bolts. Since the underside of the shield will be against the ground, I won't do too much detailing, but just paint it in natural wood with a brown strap. All colors will be painted in poly -S. When painting, I highly recommend using OptiVisors with the highest magnification. Although it may not seem like it, you're straining your eyes when you're painting fine detail. Over the years, the strain will become noticeable, and it can definitely shorten your painting career. By the way, I advise stirring your paint rather than shaking it, because when you shake it, you'll get paint all along the inside of the cap, and you'll have a difficult time removing it later. Since the tartan pattern on the cloak will be the most difficult 
and red is the dominant color, I'll start with that. When you use your palette paper, be sure to use the waxy side. If you don't, the paint's liable to soak through. I'll place a few drops on my palette with a stir stick and add a couple of drops of water to achieve the right consistency. I want it thin but not runny. The paint should be applied with thin layered coats to keep brush strokes to a minimum and to avoid obscuring detail. Don't apply one thick heavy coat. I'll use a number four Windsor Newton flat brush. Use a good saber brush. Good tools will reflect the quality of your work. While this is drying, I'll paint the flesh polyest desert pink. Desert pink resembles flesh more than the polyest flesh does. If you can't get the desert pink, use the flesh. I'll use a Windsor Newton number one brush for this. I'll leave the eyes the color of the gray primer. White is too stark, while the color of the primer does nicely. While the flesh tones dry, I'll go ahead and paint the war coat. I'll mix white with polyest bugbear fur from the polyest line of fantasy colors. I want to achieve a buff color. Remember, use thin, even layered coats when you paint. I'll go ahead and paint the leggings dark blue. The shoes and ties brown. The scabbard and baldric reddish brown. The actual articles were leather and painting them in a different shade gives them an interesting and realistic effect. I'll go ahead and paint the shield green and brown in quarters and paint the brass colors later. The sword grip, I'll go ahead and paint it the black I mentioned. If you get a little color onto another color, Paint over it with the correct color when it's dry. Get used to correcting even the tiniest mistakes. Strive for perfection. Macbeth was a redhead, so I'll base coat his beard with polyest brown 500308. A redheaded person does not have bright red hair like a stop sign. His teeth I'll leave the color of the primer because again, white would be too stark. Once the red on the cloak is good and dry, I'll come back with the green with a number one Windsor Newton brush and paint vertical and horizontal stripes, gathering over his shoulder where the cloak is crimped into the brooch. Where the stripes intersect, I'll paint a dark green when dry. And when that dries, I'll paint yellow vertical and horizontal pinstripes over this pattern. I'll add a touch of orange at their intersections. It's tedious painting, but worth it. Painting the eyes is very important because they can make or break the face which in turn can make or break your figure. With a polyest dark brown mixture, outline the white portion of the eyes with a triple art brush. This is where a good brush is really worth it. Then, for the irises, use brown with a triple art brush covering about one third of the white portion of the eye. Have the top one third of the iris cut off by the upper eyelid and the bottom of the iris just touching the bottom lid. You could have the eyes looking to either side if you wish, which is a little easier than centering them. Just don't have them looking at each other or away from each other. While I'm painting the eyes, I'll go ahead and outline the teeth in the same color. Painting the eyes with this method will prevent the pop-eyed or bug-eyed look so evident in figures painted by beginners. Be careful with blue, green, and gray eyes because in this small scale, the light color makes it hard to distinguish the iris from the eye whites, again, giving the figure a pop-eyed look. To prevent this, paint a dark color first, then come back with the eye color you want, but leave an outer edge of the dark color. The small wedge of white pointing toward the pupil isn't necessary in this scale, nor is painting the pupil. Don't gloss the eye, it'll make the figure look like he's crying. When your base coat is good and dry, we're ready to paint the face in oils. Remember, painting the face is the most important part of the figure, so pay close attention.
Miniaturists use different combinations of colors to mix up the flesh tones they want. There is no single correct way, and in time you'll come up with a selection of colors you prefer. I'll demonstrate the methods I use that give me very pleasing results. With your palette knife, mix a little flesh hue with a little cadmium orange and yellow ochre. The more cadmium orange you add, the more suntan the skin you get. Add a pinch of viridian green or ultramarine blue. This grays down the skin tone to soften the dominant warm colors in the mixture. The effect can be appreciated if you compare the mixture before and after graying it down. To this mixture, add a little liquid by Winsor & Newton. Liquin is an oil medium that gives your oil paint mixture a silky smooth consistency and imparts an eggshell finish to the skin tones when they dry, which is perfect to simulate the oil in skin. Adding more yellow ochre gives a nice tone for simulating Asian complexions. For Native American skin tones, adding a little burnt sienna will give you a ruddy complexion. Don't overdo these colors. A Native American wasn't really a red man and too much yellow ochre will make an Asian complexion look jaundiced. Black skin is easy. Just mix up shades of brown or brown matter with yellow ochre for a lighter complexion or burnt umber for a darker one. The color combinations are almost endless and experimenting with mixtures can be fun. Remember, in miniature painting you don't want to just paint the colors on as neatly as possible. You also want to best simulate the texture of what you're painting. You want skin to look like skin cloth look like cloth, etc. You can paint under incandescent or fluorescent lighting. Incandescent will give the colors a warm glow while fluorescent lighting imparts a bleached out or white hue to the colors. I personally prefer painting under incandescent lighting of 100 watts or stronger. With the number one brush, apply a smooth thin coat of the oil mixture over all your skin tones that you earlier painted polyest desert pink or flesh. Apply just one coat of the oil mixture. Be sure to keep brush strokes to a minimum. Take another brush dampened with mineral spirits to clean off any areas you don't want the oil mixture. Since the polyest base coat is a water-based paint, the mineral spirits won't affect it. Next, we shade and highlight the skin tones with oil. I use the wet on wet method, which blends your shading and highlighting colors directly on the wet oil skin tones. An extremely subtle blending can be done with oil before it dries, and oil takes time to dry anyway. This is another advantage of painting in oils. Apply small dabs of burnt umber, burnt sienna, and Mars violet on the palette. You don't need to mix liquid with this. Use an alt round brush to paint in the shading areas of the face. With burnt umber, I'll shade along all hairlines, up under the helmet and face guard, and shade the teeth, lips, and nostrils. With burnt sienna, I'll shade the lines in the face under the eyes, along the sides of the nose, and below cheekbones. With Mars violet, I'll shade the area below the brow and just above the eyelids. I use Mars violet to add a little dimension and to break up the one-two shading combination of burnt umber and burnt sienna. Remember, when blending colors, feather the edges of one color into the other. For facial highlighting, I'll again use an art brush, but this time use Naples Yellow. Again, you don't need liquid with this. I'll highlight the face first along the bridge of the nose, then the nose tip, the tops of each nostril, the cheeks, the eyelids, and above each eyebrow. As with shading, you must be subtle. I'll lightly blend the colors with my art flat brush. The contrast between the Mars violet and Naples yellow at the brow gives the appearance of an eyebrow. I seldom paint actual eyebrows, but if I want the figure to have very distinguishable, bushy eyebrows, I'll paint them in. To add blush to his cheeks, I'll mix a little red and white to make a soft pink color. Once again, you won't need liquid. Keep it subtle and blend it so it won't look like he's wearing makeup. For Macbeth's upper lip, I'll mix a little burnt sienna with the skin tone mixture. Then I'll add a little blush mixture with the skin tone mixture for the bottom lip. 
A small dot of white in the center of the bottom lip adds highlight. Brush over the beard with a thin wash of burnt sienna oil paint mixed with Dorland's wax. When dry, lightly and carefully brush the beard with Mars Yellow and a touch of Naples Yellow. With an art brush, paint the wrist burnt umber on the part that protrudes from the sleeves and burnt sienna on all lines on the hands where his muscles and tendons are. Also, use burnt sienna to outline the fingernails and shade the knuckles. Separate the fingers with Mars Violet. With the same art brush and Naples Yellow, Highlight the knuckles and raised portions of the hands. Bring out the fingernails a little more with Naples Yellow. For warmth and color, use the blush mixture around the knuckles. In Macbeth's case, his ears don't show. But if you have a figure with ears, shade and highlight with burnt umber, burnt sienna, Mars Violet and Naples Yellow. For the ear hole, use Burnt Umber. Shade the ear folds in Burnt Sienna and highlight the tops of the folds and upper edge of the ear with Naples Yellow. Then add your blush mixture to the outer edge of the ear. Make a wash out of Burnt Umber mixed with Dorland's Wax and Thinner. Using a number one flat brush, apply the wash over the chain mail, letting it flow into the recessed areas. When dry, dampen the brush with thinner and lightly wipe off the wash residue from raised areas. Prior to shading and highlighting the clothing, let's prime the nose guard and scabbard with floquil primer. Since the parts are so small, I hand brush on the floquil. Don't apply tape to the primer or it'll pull off. Next, paint the nose guard brass. You want it to dry thoroughly to avoid getting metallic color on your completed face. Using an art brush and thin burnt umber oil paint mixed with Dorland's wax, shade all the folds of the tartan. A word of caution. When mixing Dorling's wax, the amount will vary with the color of oil paint you're using. Darker oils take more wax to make it dull than lighter colors. Too much wax will make your paint separate. A rule of thumb, start with an amount of Dorling's that equals 20% of the amount of paint on your palette. Darker colors may need more wax for a flatter finish. After you finish shading, highlight the tops of the folds with Naples Yellow mixed with a touch of Dorland's Wax. Use an art flat brush for a more subtle blend. Remember to feather the edges. If the shading or highlight is too sharp of a definition, lightly feather the entire color line with your blending brush. Remember, the shading and highlighting colors are the only colors you need to flatten with the wax. Water-based paint isn't as smooth, so if your flattened oil paint areas don't blend smoothly, you can feather the edges with your blending brush dampened with a little mineral spirits. Using an art round brush, shade the war quilt with burnt umber. Then highlight with Naples yellow mixed with white. Be sure to shade under the quilt too. With an art round brush again, Shade the leggings with Windsor Blue and highlight with Naples Yellow. Macbeth's knee is given a highlight and feathered very subtly with a brush called a mop. Next, outline the straps with the Windsor Blue. Shade Macbeth's shoes with burnt umber, then highlight with Naples Yellow. The top of all straps in the baldric is highlighted with Naples Yellow. Highlight the top part of the baldric where it comes over the shoulder and feather this with your mop brush.
Now you attach Macbeth's nose guard. Make sure you scrape any paint off the metal before you glue it. Using a number one brush and Tester's gold enamel, paint all brass colored metallics. I use separate brushes, thinner and cleaning rags for metallics. It's very easy to get those little metal flecks everywhere if you're not careful. When dry, shade the detail with burnt umber with a triple art brush except the top portion of the helmet brace, where I'll use burnt sienna. With Tester's gloss green and gloss red, simulate the precious stones in his brooch and buckle. After painting, give definition and relief to your figure by outlining. This is a tedious and meticulous task, but the results are well worth it. Outline with burnt umber oil paint mixed with Dorland's wax using a triple lot brush. Outline with the shading color of that particular piece of clothing. When shading, it's usually easier to go right into outlining since the color is already mixed on the palette. Outline around and inside the detail of the buckle, brooch, and helmet framing, all the straps, the baldric, where the cloak lays against the body, where the chain mail meets the war quilt, around the sword grip where it goes into his hands and protrudes out the bottom, and all the detail on the shield. As a final touch before mounting, I'll mix cadmium red with alizarin crimson to simulate blood. blood on his clothing, I'll mix Dorland's wax into my blood mix to simulate blood soaked in the material. Although the medieval battles were bloody and savage, don't overdo it. All you need are a few splatters on his hands, war quilt, chain mail, leggings and shoes. Now it's time to attach Macbeth to his base. First, mix some five minute epoxy in the card. Then pry Macbeth off his paint block using an old knife. Grab high by his foot pins and use needle nose pliers to steady him. Try to handle the figure as little as possible because the oils on your hands might have a sheen. Spread epoxy on the rods with a toothpick. Then insert Macbeth into his base. Use the same epoxy to attach the shield. When it's dry, I'll mix mud from raw sienna, brown matter, and Dorland's wax and dry brush this on Macbeth's shoes, leggings, the bottom of the scabbard, and parts of the shield. When dry, Use earth tone pastels to weather groundwork and Macbeth's clothing. This will join the figure with his surroundings. You may want to add a nameplate to your finished figure. A good trophy shop can help you with the right size, color, and lettering. You may also want to sign your name and year on the back of the base. For competition, you'll want to set up your display to be attractive to both the viewer and the judge. Using props such as blocks of wood, set them at different levels and take velvet or velour of your color choice and drape them over it. 
Then, arrange your miniatures to execute a well-balanced display. If you plan on entering competition, it helps to know what judges look for. Experienced judges use a guide called the International Judging Criteria. While it's not a checklist or an absolute guide, it does offer some general hints on how to better your chances for winning. According to the IJC, the most important judging standards are, number one, painting skill. For stock figures, this amounts to 70% of what judges look for. If your paint job is bad, judges won't even look at the rest of your display. This is why face painting and detailing is so important. Number two, workmanship. For stock figures, this counts for 10% for all other figure classes, 25 to 30%. However, your workmanship should always be top notch. Number three, presentation. This amounts to 10 to 15% for all classes of figures. Presentation is often the deciding factor when all other elements of several figures are equal. If there are two figures of equal quality, the one with the better pose or base might have an advantage. Number four, creativity. This amounts to 10 to 15 percent. Number five, degree of difficulty accounts for 10 to 15 percent. Historical accuracy shouldn't be a deciding factor in figure shows, but you could be penalized for blatant historical errors. In the end, contest winning comes down to a matter of skill and a bit of luck. Just do the best you can. There's more to the judging criteria, but this should give you a general idea. Hope you enjoyed how to build and paint figures. Look for other tapes in the Video Workbench series. And remember, to become a skilled miniaturist, you must keep your paintbrush wet.